Well, if you're joining us, if you're a guest with us, we are in the middle of a series, a four-week series on the power of our mouths, it's conversation, discussions, and a number of you have texted me like, when are we going to be done with this? When's the next series? Can we just skip ahead on this? And so I feel your pain. I'm, I'm with you on that. This is week three. We have another week next weekend, but bear with me. I believe God wants to do a work. We just sang about grace. And I just feel like as we talk about this subject every week, that this is a context and a safe place. This is a place of grace. This is an environment of grace. What is grace? We just sang about it. it. It's worth sharing with you the definition. There are two parties involved when it comes to grace. You and I are one party. God is the other party. God brings the unconditional love. I bring the imperfection. That's what grace is. Unconditional love meeting imperfection. And in this topic, all of us can relate to being in conversations where we said something we wish we could take back. The inevitable toothpaste coming out of the, coming out. You cannot put it back in that tube. It's been said, you can't take it back. We all regret times where we didn't say what needed to be said or where we said something we wish wouldn't have been said. So I just want you to know this is a place of grace. God sees that, he's aware of that, and he offers you and I grace. We've been in the book of James, chapter 3 of the book of James that we've been looking at. And here at Boulder Mountain, we make disciples as we help people find and follow Jesus. Jesus is a big deal here, and we look to him as our example and our model in every area of life, specifically for today in this area. Anytime we want God to do a work in us, Jesus says in John 15, 5, that apart from him, we can do nothing. If this is an area of your life that you would like to turn over to the will and control of God, it begins by turning our lives over to the control of Jesus. We can't just simply turn one area of our life. It begins with the relationship with Jesus because apart from him, we can do nothing. So James chapter 3, you're going to do something a little bit different today. I'm just feeling like doing new things today. I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. And if you do not have a copy of God's Word, you can leave today. We have some Bibles in the back. It's our gift to you. You can also download it on the Version app. It's free of charge. But we want you to have a copy of God's Word. James 3, verses 9 through 12. Let's stand in honor of reading of God's Word. Verse 9. With it, the tongue is the topic, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, Bear olives or a grapevine produce figs. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So, Father, would you teach us these things? Help us to see things we've not seen before. And the things we have seen before, Holy Spirit, would you cause us to act upon it? Give us the courage to do what you're asking us to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A number of years ago, I was a youth pastor. Uh, and when you're a youth pastor, you'll always have a love for students and youth ministry. And I'm so grateful for the work that happens here on Wednesday nights with our youth ministry and our children's ministry. Grateful for all our volunteers. I went to a Bible camp when I was living in the Midwest. I was a youth pastor. I took a junior high group to a camp, one of the first camp experiences that these students had had. And this was kind of the beginning of the new modern worship era. It was the late 90s. And I remember these junior high students in a row at camp, and they were worshiping with everything they had. They, I was so proud of them as their youth pastor there. Some of them were learning and understanding worship for the very first time. A couple of them had their hands in the air. I'm like, these are junior high students. I'm so proud of them. They know how to worship. And I'm looking at the other youth groups and like, they're not as good as my youth group, right? <laughs> and this one, middle of the song, this one boy He's worshiping with everything he's got. And then the row behind him, that youth group, man, they were, they were a bunch of knuckleheads, right? They weren't involved in worship like 
youth group I had brought, and they're, they're goofing off, and they're punching each other, and one of my students finally reached a point where they turned around and said, shut up, trying to worship, <laughs> trying to worship here, would you be quiet, trying to worship, and at that moment, all the pride I had for my youth group just kind of went away, <laughs> and I realized, man, we're all a work in progress, right? But it brought me back to this passage in James chapter 3 where he, James says the same thing. Hey, we worship God one moment and we're cursing our brother the very next moment. Shut up, I'm trying to worship. Right? Do you, do you see the problem there? James recognizes, hey, there's, there's, a, there's a dichotomy here. We worship one moment and then the next moment we can't stand the person sitting next to us. We drive out of church and we're cursing the person who cuts us off, right? We just left a house of worship where we're praising God. God says through his son Jesus, what's the most important commandment? Love God and love people. It's not either or. It's not love God at the expense of people. It's not love people at the expense of your worship of God. Do you know what? You can do both. James tells us that here in chapter 3. You and I can love God, we can worship God, at the same time love our neighbor. We can love our neighbor as we love God. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It doesn't end there, my friends. And the second, same, like unto it, love your neighbor as, as yourself, right? Love your neighbor in the same way as you, as you love God. It's it's not either or, it's both and. We're to love God and we're to love our neighbor. We're to love people. Sometimes it's easier, hey, just let me worship. Uh, sometimes I've heard this saying, ministry's great, it's the people that I struggle with. <laughs> All joking aside, right, people. In, in your life, in my life, if it's people that, God, give me the wisdom to know what to, help me to love my neighbor I mean, to love people. In this topic on conversation, uh, a few things to start off with here. Any conversation we have usually falls into one of four categories. Parent-child relationships, spouse relationships, co-worker relationships, uh, conversations you have with your barista or fast food, whoever, your neighbor, your physical neighbor, first starts out as cliches. Some of us probably had them in the patio today as we were walking in. How was your week? How are you doing? Right. Parents love this question with kids at school. How was school? Right? How many times have we heard that growing up? How was school? Same as yesterday, same as the thousand other days that I just got. How was school? Right? If you want a different answer, ask a different question. But cliches, they're okay. You can't live in cliches. The next line of communication, facts. What did you have for lunch today? Right? All right. I, I had chicken for lunch. It's a fact. Can you pick up milk on your way home from work? Facts. Important, those are things that you can text, right? Not every part of communication should be a text. But facts, you can, you can text. It's part of helping each other out. It's part of sharing what's going on in your world and in your life. Cliches, second level is facts. Third level, emotions and feelings, right? Now, just any, any of the men in the room who are married, you've learned this. You cannot argue with your wife's feelings, right? Nobody can tell you how to feel. Your feelings are personal to you, and as much as I might throw debate over how somebody else is feeling, I can't change how they feel. I can't argue with how they're feeling. Emotions and feelings should be an important part of our everyday conversation. Oh, that happened at school today. How did you feel about that when that happened? Right? E emotions. And some of us might be homework just to learn more words in our vocabulary than good and bad. Right? There's, there's a whole range of emotions that God's given to us and that for us to be able to identify what, what are we feeling about that, right? How was school today? Bad. I went to the principal's office. So, you know, a question my mom asked me a lot. How did you feel about going to the principal's office, right? She wanted to seek to understand a little bit more about that. Ask questions in our conversation. You want to get to know somebody, be curious. When you sit down with them for coffee, ask questions questions. Get to know the person. As you get to know the person, it'll help you understand where they're coming from. Before you meet with them, have 10 questions ready to go. I want to get to know them. I want to understand who they are and what, 
why they might think the way they think. Emotions and feelings are a really important part of who, of who we are. The final level, the fourth level, beliefs and convictions. Right? We can't live on the top two levels, but it's important that we have times where we can share what our convictions and beliefs are about a subject. Oh, we've lost the art of this in our culture today, to be able to share. By God's grace, he's allowed me to come to the conclusion of some things in my life I feel pretty strongly about, but it's taken 50 years to get there. Why would I think somebody who's in their 20s would be at the same place that I'm at? If I really believe that I'm right about something, I'm not right about everything. I'm, I'll admit that to you. But there's some things I really believe I'm right about. Then God's going to be as patient with that person as he's been with me to arrive to that same conclusion. It is not my job to convince or be the Holy Spirit in another person's life. We can listen. We can understand. You and I can ask questions. But it's not my job to tell somebody else how to believe and what they should be convicted of. Nowhere in Scripture am I told to do that. It's not my role as a pastor. It's not my role as a husband. It's not my role as a parent. It's not my role as a neighbor. Jesus says, love my neighbor. Not convince them to believe the same way that I believe about every certain issue in life. Right? Sit down. Seek to understand. Ask questions. And I know this is stretching us. Even be open to say the prayer, God, if I'm wrong in this area, would you make that clear to me? Would you be willing to show me the error of my ways? And I am open to learn from another human being who is made in the image and the likeness of God. It says here in this passage that every other person that you've ever met in life is made in the image and the likeness of God and we're to treat them as such. Facts and cliches, emotions, feelings, convictions, and beliefs. Really important to make sure that you have parents. If you have children, you have those conversations with your kids. They're not most of your conversations, but there are times you get alone with them and you ask them, hey, what do you, what do you think about that? What do you feel like God wants you to do? As a parent, I can tell my kids what to do, how to act, how, what to believe every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Or I can say, what do you feel like? Based on what you know of God and based on what God's doing in your life, what do you think God wants you to do in that area? And then zip your mouth up and listen and then coach them, right? Listen to what they say. And this is all dependent on what age they're at, right? You can't do that with a two-year-old. But you listen to them, you, you love them, and you engage with them, and you seek to understand. As, as Boulder Mountain Church, we, we make decisions that are going to help us follow Jesus. So in this topic, I spent some time looking at well, how did Jesus use his speech and his language as he interacted with people based on the topics that we have in the Gospels? Let me give you uh, one of them. He asked 307 questions in the text of the Gospels. He asked 307 questions. He sought to understand. If anybody didn't need to ask questions, it was Jesus he knew everything. But what do you think he was doing when he asked questions? He's given us an opportunity to respond. The very first question that he asked is the first words we have of Jesus in Scripture. It's when he gets lost. He doesn't get lost. His parents got lost. He's at the temple studying. His parents are losing their, their minds. Now, when I was 12, I got lost a lot, but it wasn't because I was at church, right? The parents were like, Where's, where, where'd Jesus go? We can't find Jesus first words we have of Jesus is, hey, he asked his parents a question. Where did you think I was going to be? Don't you know that I'd be at the temple? I'd be studying? First words of Jesus is a question. Second words of Jesus we have as he begins his ministry is also a question. The followers of, of John, the disciples of John, they're trying to keep up with Jesus. And the first words we have of Jesus as he begins his ministry is he stops and he waits. And he says, how can I help you? Or in one translation, what do you want from me? What is it that I can do for you? So good on this topic, friends. As we follow Jesus, number one, he stops and waits for us. If you're following Jesus, the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit, day-to-day -day life, he will wait for you. Jesus is patient with us. He will wait for us. But he stops and he turns to the followers of John. He says, hey, what do you want from me? How can I help you? Oh, good words. 
from our Lord and Savior. He asks us all today, how can I help you? Have you when was the last time you asked somebody that question? Hey, I'm here for you. What can I do for you? How can I help today? Boy, it just de-escalates whatever the situation is. I, I wanna, I'm here to serve you. And Jesus begins his ministry by asking the question. He asked 307 questions. He's asked 87 questions. How many of those does he answer? Three. <laughs> he only answers three of those questions. Now, part of that is Middle Eastern conversations, much more question-oriented, seeking to understand and get to know somebody as opposed to our culture where we tell people how it is, right? <laughs> tell people what to do, when to do it, how to do it. But it was much more of a, hey, let's have a conversation. And the goal wasn't the answer. The goal was the, the conversation. Following, following Jesus. I want to take you to a, a passage today. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Otherwise, I'll kind of walk you through it. There are a number of passages of Scripture where there are misunderstandings that lead to conflict. Many in the Old Testament, I thought of going through three or four different stories. I'm like, that's too much. You're, you're going to leave here overwhelmed. So I felt God just saying, zero in on one story. There are times where misunderstandings lead to wars in, in the Old Testament, where people just didn't sit down and have a conversation and seek to understand, and before you know it, there's bloodshed. That still happens to this day, where we don't seek to understand from the other person, and misunderstanding leads to conflict. There's a story in 1 Samuel 25. Let me give you the three characters. One character is David. Now, David has the position of king at this time, but he is not living the practice of a king. He is not in a castle. He's not in a throne. He's not in a temple. He, he's a king without territory at this point in time. He has a, a group of men. It's his warriors. It's his soldiers that they're living out in the desert. That's David, first character. The second character is a man named Nabal. Nabal, if you translate it, means fool. How would you like that for a name? Nabal, fool. He's, he's a husband. He's wealthy. He owns a lot of land. He owns a lot of sheep. So you have David, you have Nabal, and you have Nabal's wife named Abigail. Let me walk you through the context of 1 Samuel 25. David is providing security for the, for the sheep of Nabal. David's men interact with the shepherds of Nabal, and they're kind. They provide security. They eliminate threats. They don't attack them. I guess that's kind back in the day. If you don't attack somebody, that's, that's a kind thing to do. And so he sends one of his servants, David sends one of his servants to Nabal and, and asks for permission. Would we be allowed to stay on your land? Would you, allow, would you be able to send us some food? Could you send us some water? We've been good to you. Nabal, would you be in return good to to me, okay? What is Nabal's response? Nabal says to the servant, go back and tell David, I don't know who you are. There's a lot of people running away. There are criminals out there. I don't know. I have any idea who you are, and I'm not giving you anything. So the servant goes back to David, and David says, all right, strap on your swords. We're going to war, right? David really thought that one through. He really sat down, and, but his reaction. How many of us get into trouble simply because of our first reaction? Our reactions many times are greater than our actions. How we react in that moment, one of two things. Listen, when there's a problem, when there's conflict, anybody have conflict in their life in any situation, any relationship in work and community and family, there's one of two responses. And James talks about it here in chapter 3. Blessing or curse blessing to someone or a curse to someone? The first response, there's a problem. Someone comes to you with a problem. What do you and I do? We add fuel to it. We add gasoline to the problem, and it only makes it worse. Somebody's coming to you. They're looking for sympathy. They're looking for an ally, and they share a problem with you, and you're like, I know, right? That's how 
conversations get started in the workroom about your direct reports, right? About corporate, I can't believe they're doing this to us. And everybody starts complaining, you're adding fuel to that fire. How you respond when somebody comes to you with a problem, you have one of two options. You can add fuel to it. You can, you can turn that spark, again, as James talks about, the fire. You can turn that spark. Now it's, now it's bigger. After the conversation with you and I, that fire is bigger than it was before. So you and I have, a conversa- you and I have an option. When somebody comes to us and starts complaining or they share a problem with us, are we going to add to that? Or are we going to carry water to the situation and be a blessing, right? Be a blessing to that conversation. When we see the spark, there's a problem here, and I'm going to pour water on it. Now, sometimes you have to ask yourself the question, do I have the authority to solve this problem? And so that's going to determine how you, how you respond in the words that you say. And, but I... I have found in in my life, when I go to somebody and I've got a problem and I want to talk about 10 other people, the best thing that they can do to be a blessing to me is to talk about me, not 10 other people. Well, Kyle, what do you think God wants you to do? Kyle, what do you think the Holy Spirit's revealing to you? What's your part in this? It's much easier to talk about the 10 other people and complain and gripe about them. But a blessing, what does it mean to be a blessing in that conversation? It's to pour water. Do we escalate problems? Are you known as a person who escalates problems or de-escalates problems? Followers of Jesus should be known as people of peace. Should be, there should be a line outside your door if they know you're a follower of Jesus, seeking the peace of the company, of the community, and of the family. Oh, I know that person. They're not going to be respond with emotion. They're going to respond with wisdom. Listen, seek to understand, and then I can either pour gasoline on it or I can pour water on it. Now let's go back to our story in 1 Samuel 25. There's a war about to go down between Nabal's family and his people and David's army. They're about to both march down into that valley and there's going to be bloodshed. Dozens, if not hundreds of people are going to die if someone does not intervene. And so Abigail, Nabal's wife, hears of this. And she says, I am going to intervene. I'm going to pour water on this whole situation. Thank, thank goodness there are a- Abigails in our lives, right, who have de-escalated problems in our in our life. So in 1 Samuel 25, Abigail loads up some donkeys with food and she marches down the valley to meet one of David's servants. And she tells the servant, hey, I apologize for my husband. Right? Every good woman has apologized for their husband at one point in time. He, he's a fool. Actually, his name is a fool. He's a fool. He was drunk He didn't know what he was doing, so I'm going to respond, and I'm going to send, and whatever you need, forgive me, but whatever you need, I'm going to meet that need, okay? And so she goes, and she gets off the donkey, and she goes to David. And do you know what she does? She gets off the donkey, and she bows before David. Now, has she done anything wrong at this point? No. She bows before David. And she says, oh, my Lord. She recognizes David, who is the king. She knows the stories of David. David was a popular man back then. Everybody knew the stories of David. And she says, forgive my husband. Whatever you need, whatever you want, I will give it to you. As long as you spare the bloodshed that's going to occur to What is she doing? Is she adding fuel or is she adding water to the situation? So she... We look at 1 Samuel chapter 25. We'll pick it up here in verse 28. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. She is now prophesying to David. David, you don't want to do this. God's going to give you your kingdom one day. 
If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. In the lives of your enemies, he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. See what she's doing here? Oh, she's so wise. She's bringing back to his mind the sling. You're David with the sling, right? He is putty in her hands right now. He's like, tell me more. <laughs> Keep talking. And he, his anger is being de-escalated as she speaks. Blessing or a curse? Is she a blessing or a curse in this conversation? And verse 30, And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause, or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt with my Lord, then remember your servant. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt. She's saying, there's going to be a story written about you one day. That is true for each and every one of us in this room. There is a story that's going to be written about us. First, it's a lot of little stories that add up to one story. How you respond, she's saying, how you react in this situation is going to keep you from having blood on your hands when you're the king. You don't want this to turn out the way you intended it to go. You have an option. And she is so wise. Do you hear the word blessing in this passage? David says, you, you've been a blessing. She saved hundreds of lives. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't her problem. But she hopped on the donkey and she's like, I'm going to intervene before this turns, before this turns deadly. Now, there's three characters in the story. How can you and I be a blessing rather than a curse in our conversations and in our speech, not just this week, but the rest of our lives? What does this look like? Number one, think before reacting, right? Think it through, ask questions, seek to understand. The three characters of the story, uh, I'm a visual person, sometimes this helps me. So you have Nabal, N-A-B-L here. And what, how does he respond? He responds evil for good. All right? David was good to him. He receives something good and in turn is going to give evil back to David. Some of us have been treated that way. We, I can't believe. Do you know what I did for them and this is how they treat me? Anybody ever said that? Have ever thought that? Nabal, evil for good. He's maniacal. Give me grace on how I spell this. Uh, another word, narcissistic, only thinks of himself. He was living like a king without a kingdom, right? He didn't have the position of king. He was living like a king. David had the position of king. He's living out in the wilderness. Maniacal. We've all worked with people. We've all known people, very selfish people, right? Uh, Nabal, maniacal. The second character you have is, is David. Now, what, is, what does David do? Evil for evil. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye. I'm going to get even with them. How dare they treat me this way? Anybody ever thought that? Uh, evil for evil. They were bad to me. I'm now going to get even with them. Why would you want to get even with somebody you don't even like? Why would you want to be even with them, right? David, evil for evil. This is very predictable in our culture. You and I want to be like everybody else. This is what our culture teaches. They treat you that way. You, you need to stick up for yourself, and you need to treat them that way. You need to let them have it. Evil for evil. That's David. Very predictable. That's everyone. That's the world's way. The world's way says you've been mistreated, then you mistreat other people. But friends, we, f we believe in a different way. There's a different way. There's a better way. It's the way of Jesus. 
as portrayed through the person of Abigail in the Old Testament. Now, Abigail's not a type of Christ. Nowhere in the Bible says that. But how she responds is, is beautiful. Abigail. What does Abigail do? It's what Jesus teaches all of us to do. Good for evil. Jesus says, you have heard it said, right? What does Jesus tell us to do with our enemies? Pray for our enemies. Pray for those who persecute us. Pray for them. Be kind to them. Be good to them. Love them. Listen, it is really easy to love people who love me. It is really easy to give a Christmas gift to somebody who gave me a Christmas gift. That's easy. Jesus doesn't say, love those who love you. Love those who persecute you. Love those who's mistreated you. And I believe maybe the most incarnational, that's a church word, the most Jesus-like, Christ-like action you and I could ever make is to be kind and loving to an enemy, to someone who has mistreated, to somebody who does not deserve it. Does that sound familiar? I do not deserve the love and grace that God has given me. I don't. Jesus did not treat me as I deserve. What would it look like for you and I to be remarkable in our response? To not get even, but to be above the world. Jesus flips everything upside down, doesn't he? The way of Jesus is upside down from the world's way. Pray for those who persecute you. Peter, uh, the man who cut off the ear of a soldier. Remember that guy? They came to take Jesus, and, and, and Peter kind of loses his temper. He was a little bit of a hothead. I'm, gr- I'm so grateful that there's a, a, a book of the Bible written, a couple books of the Bible written by a hothead. But first Peter, he's writing to the persecuted church, to people who are being killed because of their faith. Peter writes, if I can find it, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. I had a doggy eared. There we go. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, and a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil. He is writing this to the church that's being persecuted. He does not say, stand up for your rights and defend yourselves. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, listen, sounds familiar here. We're not in James 3, but it's still here. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. You and I having and experiencing peace is not dependent on how you're treated. You can, you can be a person of peace despite the way you and I have been treated. By how? By getting even? No. By returning evil with good. Proverbs puts it, heap, heap coals of kindness on someone's head. When they least expect it, they're going to be so surprised. They're going to confuse them by being kind. Now, how does, how does the story of the Bible, how can Jesus tell us to love our enemies? Because that's what he did. I want to just, as we close today, share with you that it was our words that put Jesus on the cross. It was our words. One day we were worshiping him, and the next day we're saying, shut up. In other words, one day we're saying, Hosanna to Jesus as he enters Jerusalem, and the very next day we're saying, crucify him. We were part of that crowd. Our words have consequences. And it was when they said, crucify him. Give us somebody else. Release somebody else. Crucify Jesus. What does Jesus do? You learn a lot about somebody by how they die. The words that they say at the end of their life reveals a lot about somebody. For those words flow from the heart. 
in the words of Jesus, the final words of Jesus. We looked at the first words of Jesus that he said as he began his ministry, the final words of Jesus on the cross. There's seven of them. There's a prophecy in the book of Psalms, Psalms 40, that refers to the words of Jesus. It's fascinating. But one of the words that Jesus says from the cross to his enemies who cried out, crucify him, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. His love was so great on our worst day. When we're the enemy of God, God sends Jesus to reconcile that. Jesus knows a thing or two about loving enemies. He doesn't ask us something to do that he's not willing to do. Some of the other statements, seven sayings from the cross, some are facts, some are emotions, and some are beliefs and convictions. And my friend, when he says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do, that was from a conviction of truth. God's saying, I'm going to forgive them. Despite the beating, despite the stabbing, despite the bloodshed that was happening there on the cross, Jesus is a person of peace. He's saving people off to his, his side. The last words of the cross offers forgiveness. Listen, the words you and I speak can offer forgiveness, can offer salvation, love, atonement, suffering, victory, and security are the final words of Jesus. I share with you, um, a number of you, if, if Boulder Mountain's been your home this past year, I've shared a number of times about the conflict within my family. There's seven siblings and my dad. That makes eight of us. We live in eight different states. That's how well we get along. <laughs> Joking aside, we do, we do love each other, but there's been some conflict in our family for years. And something I've shared with you, something I've been praying about, I got nominated to be the reconciler of, I don't know how that happened, but we, we got together a couple times, we did some Zoom calls, but before Christmas, there were some emails sent, letters given of great humility. I am sorry. I didn't think it ever happened. I was wrong. I hurt you 20 years ago. And when that occurs, God can do anything. But it requires humility. It requires somebody to sit down and write the letter and own some stuff. You can't own somebody else's stuff, but you can own yours. You can own it. And since that happened, there has been great reconciliation in my family. We have a Zoom call now every first Saturday of the month. It was scheduled to go an hour. It went two hours and 20 minutes in January, their first call. We had a lot of catching up to do. I tell you, there is nothing sweeter than reconciliation of family members that's been broken for many years. God wants that for you. If there are severed relationships, he wants there to be redemption. It's better now than it ever has been before, which is ironic, right? After conflict, it's better because there's been humility shared. If there's been a word, a harsh word said in a family, Somebody represented in this room, I'm telling you, God wants to restore that. But it requires some of us to, to be humble, own some things, even if it wasn't our fault. Abigail, she, got down, she owned some stuff. Charge it to me, she says, for my husband's dumb actions. Charge it to me. By the way, the end of that story... She comes home and tell, was going to tell him that there's no war going on. I got to tell you, because I didn't tell him the first service, and everybody's like, how'd that story end? <laughs> so she's going to come home and tell him, but he's drunk. So she's like, I don't think now's the right time to tell him. So I'm going to wait till morning. So she waits till morning, and morning comes, and she tells him, and he has a heart attack, and he dies 10 days later. David proposes, they get married, and they live happily ever after. <laughs> True story. David becomes, Abigail becomes David's wife, and right? Now you know how the story ends. You can look it up and confirm that for yourself later. But I, there is redemption that God wants to do in this room based on the words we've spoken out of anger, things that have been said, 
that we regret. And I'm encouraging you and challenging you to move toward healing in that area. Don't move away from it. God's waiting on you to take the first step. How are, what are you going to do? There's this Friday night. There's an opportunity to begin to work on some things in our lives through a group called Life's Healing Choices. 6.30 p.m. here at Boulder Mountain for the next eight weeks. Each week we'll look at one of the Beatitudes of Scripture. And it's open for anybody who has identified an area of their life that you've recognized it, but now it's time to do the work. You can't heal from it unless you deal with it. It could be any number of a hundred different things. This is a safe place. Come, work on it. Some, some teaching, then we'll break off for some gender-based discussion. It will be helpful for you if there's an area of your life that you, you've identified. could be this topic here. I, I don't want to live the rest of my life with this. I encourage you to take that step. Would you pray with me? So, Father, as we hear your word this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move and convict if necessary. God, and some of us, maybe we have done everything we can do, and, and now we're waiting on you. So I pray that you would move in the hearts of the other people, that you would soften hearts, that you would reconcile relationships. That's the business that you're in. God, I'm so grateful for your work you've done in my life, in, in our family. It's not perfect, but thank you for the humility. I, I pray that we would repay evil with good, we would pray for those, that we would follow Jesus, that far better way than what the world has to offer. God, to respond to what you're asking us to do here is going to take courage. So I pray that you would grant us the courage and the wisdom to know what to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.